we have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order. This is Multipolarity, charting the rise of the new multipolar world order. Coming up this week... Bloomberg says Germany's days as an industrial superpower are coming to an end, which poses at least one serious question. Has Bloomberg been listening to Multipolarity podcast? As the industrial decline narrative goes mainstream, it seems like the copium has finally run out in the chancelleries of Europe. Meanwhile, reports in the West of a Chinese bust have reached the kind of fevered tone normally associated with the final days of a boom. Yet somehow, retail spending is growing at 7.4% a year, and prices of consumer items like cars are still coming down. So, is this the world's first projection recession? Finally, Egypt is threatening to withdraw from the 1979 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. How much of this is sabre-rattling designed to please the average Egyptian in the street? And will it be enough to stop the Egyptian in the street becoming the Egyptians in Tahrir Square? But first, Deutschland unter alles. So the newspapers and so on are reporting that Germany is deindustrializing. That won't be uh, much of a surprise to our listeners. We've been saying that since we started the podcast. It's been one of the constant themes along with uh, Chinese chip production stories on the podcast. We've been saying for a while that Germany would um, would deindustrialize due to the higher energy prices in Europe. This seemed perfectly logical to us. I, I think we were very confident in it because we never saw any credible alternative explanations. But um, the mainstream media is kind of caught up now and they're admitting it. So Bloomberg ran a headline last week saying, uh, Germany's days as an industrial superpower are coming to an end. Um so basically, it's being admitted, um, and more than it just being admitted, uh, it's also being admitted that there's no plan moving forward, because the plan was effectively to say that crazy people like those guys who put out the Multipolarity podcast show and say deindustrialization take place are either crazy or they work for a foreign power or, you know, whatever, cope was in the water that day. Um that's run out. The cope has run out. Everyone's realized that the uh, that the LNG is much more expensive than the Russian pipe gas, and that uh, is going to feed into costs of industry in Europe, uh, which will render that industry uncompetitive. We've been through this a few times before. So just some quick updates on the story itself before we can kind of talk about what happens now that uh, Europe's cope narrative has collapsed. Um, the first thing I'd say is um, uh, the meme that's been put out that this is all due to net zero and green energy policies has now got traction in the mainstream. Um, prior to basically people admitting these problems, that was a kind of behind the scenes thing. If, if, if you talk to people, um, they might say privately this was due to green energy policy. You'd see it on a lot of the especially right wing Twitter accounts blaming this on the Greens and so on. Now it's gone kind of mainstream. So, for example, Siegfried Russwurm, head of Germany's main industry association, uh, told the Financial Times that um, Germany's climate agenda is, quote, more dogmatic than any country I know, end quote. Now, what do you really say about this? Well, there's some truth to it, of course. Um, the reliance that Germany and much of Europe had on Russian gas was due to their uh, their refusal to, um, their, or their their desire to implement green energy policies, but um, the extent to which this is the case is exaggerated. It's not like Europe is sitting on pools of oil that they aren't extracting from the ground because they want to be the greenest in the world. Um, Europe is a famously research resource poor country. There's there's coal. There's coal in England. There's coal in Germany, and so on. I suppose conceivably they could use more coal, and some of that is due to green green uh, concerns. But you know, a lot of countries have have dragged down their coal uh, output. But really, the key point is whether you could make a credible case that just scrapping green policies, Europe would have a perfectly decent energy grid or not. That's not really the question here. the The offer on the table was to use the Russian gas and greenify your economy, and then the Russian gas got got. Um, 
got shut off. Now, it may make people feel better to say, oh, that was your fault ultimately because you did a stupid policy. Yeah, well, that doesn't, that doesn't literally, in this instance, that doesn't keep the lights on. That's a stupid excuse. So my sense of it actually here is that the Americans are getting quite savvy at using components of what I'd call the culture war, which I think green energy policy is kind of become part of. And they've latched on to right wing narratives about um, green energy policy, many of which I agree with. I'm not going to lie. But, um, you know, they've latched on to those and they're using them as a distraction technique um, to distract from the fact that effectively Europe have got completely screwed over by the war and by the sanctions. Uh, the last thing I'd say to just show how uh, deep this screwing over is, um, Joe Biden uh, in late January uh, said that they uh, that the US will be pausing LNG export projects moving forward to appease uh, green activists in his base. Now, again, the right wing will go, oh, well, this is, see, it's about the greens and all this. Yeah, ignore that. No, the real issue here is that the Democrat administration and the US government in general don't see this as a priority. They don't care what happens to European uh, industry and they don't care about European energy markets. It's just not a priority. Trust me, those same activists couldn't come along and get Joe Biden to stop the Gaza war, for example. I mean, that's literally true. So it's about priorities here. And and this, it, it's not as some people will say, oh, this is green, this is green, this is green. It's not about that. This is about the priorities of the US government and uh, and what hap what's happened in Europe since the sanctions and the war. Um, and what we're coming to find out is that Europe has no plan, America has no plan, America doesn't care, and Europe is up S Creek without a paddle, basically. Yeah, I've never, and actually I've been arguing for about a year or so with people on X. Uh, one of my guilty pleasures, unfortunately, is to argue with random people on the internet who I think are wrong. But I've always thought uh, the folks who said this is about uh, green policies uh, are 100% wrong. Why is that? Well, it's very natural for uh, people who have uh, certain political, I don't want to use the word obsessions, but kind of, as we Brits would say, bees in their bonnet. You know, they they have a bee in their bonnet about, you know, loony green policies or, you know, misunderstood uh, economics or whatever. And what they do is any time there's any kind of crisis or any kind of whatever, they they ascribe it to that personal kind of obsession or personal interest of theirs. They don't actually look at the true causes of this. So, of course, Germany does have fairly stringent green policies, in some ways actually less stringent than in Britain, for example, but that you know that's a, another story. But they do have very stringent uh, green policies, which at the margin do increase the price of electricity. But nobody was talking about German deindustrialization five years ago. And, you know, they had stringent green policies then, didn't they? So why is it suddenly now? Well, you know, the obvious answer to this are, is twofold. Um, you, you know, you mentioned the conflict in Ukraine and the way that the sanctions that Europeans have placed on Russia in response to that have boomeranged back on Russia. And we'll get to that in a second. But the other thing that you didn't mention is that Germany's economy is very highly geared to the Chinese economy. Uh, one of the ways that Germany has made hay in the last... 20 or so years is a bit like Australia is selling stuff to the Chinese and basically riding the coattails of China's remarkable kind of breakneck speed economic growth. The Australians famously sell a lot of raw materials, coals, metals, minerals, that sort of thing. Um, meat, one assumes as well. The Germans, what, what the Germans were selling though was essentially engineered goods, high-value-added goods, capital goods, uh, famously BMWs and Mercedes. Not just that sort of thing, but that kind of higher-end, manufactured, value-added good, essentially. Now, the Chinese economy uh, was in lockdown for COVID for much longer than Western economies because of the Communist Party of China's um, uh, zero-COVID policy, and it took some time to recover. And while, as we'll talk about later in this episode, stay tuned for that, while neither you nor I buy into the 
present narrative that the Chinese economy is, you know, about to tip into 1930s-style uh, debt deflation and suffer a Great Depression, um, I think both you and I agree that the Chinese economy isn't growing at the speed that it was kind of 10 years ago, when we're really seeing some kind of big growth numbers. And after the global financial crisis, Chinese growth essentially lifted the Western world off the, off the rocky shoals of, of um, that recession. So the German economy, because it's highly geared to that, has kind of suffered from the fact that the Chinese economy has taken longer to recover from the COVID lockdown for various reasons. But now to the, you know, to the sanctions. And the argument was that what Europe would be able to do is essentially, it, instead of buying Russian pipeline gas uh, that came from kind of Siberia's vast resources and went through pipelines, some of which went through Ukraine and Poland, uh, but a lot of which went through under the Baltic Sea through the Nord Stream pipelines, they would replace that with essentially liquefied natural gas which most of the additional supply of which would come from America. Now, at first, that would be much more expensive, 50% more expensive, 40% at the very least. But gradually, because Europe would have a higher demand, that would send a signal for further investment in, 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 in new facilities to liquefy this gas and new ships, which have to be specially constructed to send it across the ocean and new regasification plants in Europe. And over time, that would bring the price down. Of course, LNG is always going to be more expensive than pipeline gas. Anybody who tells you that LNG eventually can come down to the same price as pipeline gas is, is kind of in cloud cuckoo land. It's preposterous. Like, gas in a pipeline just gets pumped through a pipe and appears at the other end. LNG has to go through a really expensive process at specially built facilities to essentially liquefied under very high pressure at like you know minus 270 degrees celsius or something like that and then it has to go into ships which are again specially constructed there are only a very limited few in the world and they're very expensive to construct they have to literally cross oceans and then get to the port and then be regasified in equally expensive facilities and then sent through pipelines at that stage. It's ludicrous to think that by adding all of that, and I mean, none of these things are, you know, measured in few pennies or cents, that, you know, they're measured in, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to construct these things. It's ridiculous to think that that would be as cheap as pipeline gas. Now, the point I've made on this uh, podcast many times before is if you took another major input to the cost of production within manufacturing, let's say labor costs, that's another big input cost. And you just said, a, a, a German government overnight says, right, from now on, everybody must pay, be paid 40% more. Every member of staff must be paid 40% more so that wage costs, the labor cost, the labor unit cost of production goes up by exactly 40%. Would anybody, would anybody in the world say that the lower profit, the lost competitiveness... And the closure of manufacturing capacity under that circumstance would be due to green policies. Would anybody say that, no, 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 that, those increased costs are, it doesn't really matter. No, of course they would. Of course they wouldn't. Everybody would say, like, yeah, that's why we're losing competitive. It's obvious. We've got, like, this major input cost. And now it's just gone up by 40%. So obviously at the margin, that's going to hammer competitiveness. It's going to lead to closures of the marginal producers in their industry. And let me tell you something. Cars, you know, making cars is kind of a low margin business. It's really competitive, not just at the Volkswagen end, but, you know, at the Mercedes end, at the Porsche end. It, 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 it's not a high margin business. You need to have like really big uh really big uh you, you know mass production to kind of like you know um, savings you know based on the scale of uh, economies of scale is the phrase i'm looking for excuse me to be able to make this system popular like volks uh, you know like a volkswagen isn't like so much more amazing than a toyota or a hyundai or whatever that people are going to pay considerably more for it it's a very competitive industry and if these guys suddenly have to pay more for their energy, and, and, and Europe is already paying more for its energy, 
then that's a big problem. So I think this combination of the, you know the gearing to China and 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 the and the additional cost of gas is starting to have an effect. It's, you know, it's not going to lead Germany to become Britain like a you know a, almost a completely services reliant economy overnight. That's not going to happen. But we will continue to see this grind. And and people who say, well, eventually China will recover or, you, you, you know, all this drawdown in inventories will work its way through the system and, and, and German manufacturing will recover. I think they're kind of missing the point. Like, trade with China and cheap gas from Russia are no longer macroeconomic issues. When We've moved outside the realms of macroeconomics and it's one of the core things that you and i have been pushing on this program is that for economic forecasting we're, we're moving into a world where geopolitics and geostrategy is as important as macroeconomics for economic forecasting and this is a great example a great example because trade with china and cheap gas from russia are now geopolitical issues and it looks to me given the way that germany is going and given the way that europe is going that they're going to be very difficult to bring back to their old levels certainly when it comes to gas from russia but even trade with china you know some countries like ireland like hungary are still kind of opening up a little bit but you know you listen to annalena baerbock you you know you listen to um, you know, Ursula von der Leyen, the uh, president of the European Commission, and they are putting up barriers for China, you know, against trade with China. So I'm not sure that's going to come back either. It doesn't look good in the long term for Germany's present economic model. They're going to have to find a new one. Yeah, well, they probably won't find a new one. Um, the issue here is actually probably a little less subtle than it looks. What happened here is that is two things. Um, one way of putting it is that um, a, a mass hysteria broke out around the time of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, and uh, European leaders were completely focused on this, and uh, the Americans convinced them to do something very stupid and jump on the LNG train, while convincing them that this was a viable strategy moving forward because of what you just said, the notion that if you pump investment into this sector, prices will come down. That's not how this works. This isn't some sort of returns to scale operation. This is gas. Um, so that's a polite way of putting it. The impolite way of putting it is Europe was scammed. A very classic instance of a business scam where um, you know a slightly shady operator will come along when you're in a vulnerable and desperate place and they'll sell you a bunch of hokum, as the Americans would say. And that's precisely what's happened here. Now, why did that happen? Obviously, I've just said why it happened on the European side. But why did it happen on the American side? Because, as I'm about to explain, this is a terrible, terrible, terrible idea for America in just about every way. So why did it happen? I'll explain why it's so terrible in a moment. But if you assume that I'm correct, that it is terrible, why did it happen? It happened because America no longer runs on strategy. And when America no longer runs on strategy, that is when the State Department and the White House and so on can no longer put together a coherent European strategy, business moves in. And when business moves in, business doesn't care. It doesn't care about the alliance structure. It doesn't care about long-term economic growth. It doesn't care about anything. All it cares about is, is moving LNG from America to Europe and making money out of it. And that's what's happened. So why is this so destructive? Well, count the ways it's so destructive. Firstly, economically, okay? We know what happens when a Euro the European economy collapses. It happened in the Great Depression, and it pulled America down with it. The Americans that I've spoken to about this, mostly more business people rather than economists, have this notion that there's some sort of a zero-sum game going on. That if, Ameri that if Europe is deindustrialized, America can take advantage of this in some way, perhaps by moving that industry onto American soil. That is nonsense. That is absolute rubbish. The economy doesn't work like that. Europe is a an economy. It has a demand side and a supply side, and they're connected. So when somebody goes and they build a, ca and they build a car in a factory in Germany, they get paid a salary, and they go out and they buy a car. Right? So it's got supply and it's got demand. 
If you remove the supply, the factories, and you move them to America, there won't be more demand because you've taken the jobs away. So this whole notion is is economically um, uh, economic nonsense. And again, it's exactly what you'd expect if this isn't some broad strategy that some people seem to think it is, you know, a nefarious plot on the part of Americans to dominate Europe. No, it's not that. It's America with no strategy, with um, moving forward in the dark, having not thought through anything at all, and business are moving in to pick the carcass. That's exactly what's going on. The second reason why it's such a terrible idea for America is because this isn't going to last. There is absolutely no way that in five to ten years from now, the Europe the Europeans are still going to be sitting here taking this bad deal. They're not locked in on any contract or anything like that. What you've done is you've got you, you, what you have is you've got an embarrassed elite. You've got a, you've got an elite that are starting to wake up the morning after the night before, and they have a bad hangover. They went through their hysteria at the start of the war, and now they're waking up and they're saying, oh, you mean our entire economic model is going to be destroyed and our country is going to fall apart? Oh, man. Well, we can't go back on it because we made the decision. Fine. They will soon get out of the way and other people will be there to make decisions, different decisions. And we're already seeing that. So in Germany... The second largest party now is the Alternative for Deutschland, the AFD, that are polling at about 20% of the vote, beyond the Social Democratic Party that's currently the majority party in government. And, and close to them is a party called Bundes Sarah Wegenacht, which is, is, a, is a party purely launched on the personality of this um, interesting left-wing figure, Sarah Wegenacht, who's been in Germany for a very long time and is finally getting some momentum behind her. What, and she's polling at 8%. That's just after launching her party a few weeks ago. The, the Greens that are in the coalition government with the Social Democratic Party are polling at 12%. They're a long established party. So Ve- Sarah Vaganok's party, this like one woman party with a couple of hangers on, is biting at the, is biting at the heels of the Green Party. So it's very clear. Oh, oh, and what do they share in common? They both disagree with this policy. They both say that this gas thing is absolute nonsense coming from the right and coming from the left. What, where is this going to go? It's pretty obvious where it's going to go. European politics is going to become increasingly anti-American. That is what is going to happen. It's already happening behind the scenes, by my calculation. And they're going to become increasingly anti-American. No, they won't, it won't be about cutting all full ties with America, or something, but it'll be about doing an independent policy, economic policy and foreign policy. And they'll start making pragmatic deals with other countries. Because if you just have one guy to deal with, he's just going to scam you like this. Now, why is that a problem? It's not really a problem. But the other thing that Americans are saying, and this is how you know America have no strategy. While Americans are saying, on the one hand, they don't really care if the European economy goes down the toilet, on the other hand, they're saying we need an entirely new global system where only the free democratic Western countries trade with the free Western democratic countries. And this is how we're going to counter the rise of the BRICS. Okay, so let me get that straight. You want to form a, a block of economic trade, friend shoring, all these new silly terms that are being thrown around. You want to form that block with Western countries, yeah? Okay. And you also want to destroy the European economy. Which do you want? Which is it? It can only be one or the other. You see, the more you look into this, the more you realize there is no strategy. It's just cope, 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 pretend that things aren't happening. And then just make up loads of nonsense as you go along, and then who and the business guys can step in and make a few a few bucks or a few quid out of it, and that's exactly what's going on here. It's complete freefall, but it's not going to last. Chinese crackers. There's been a lot of talk over the past year, uh, maybe a little little shorter than a year, about how the Chinese economy is. Somewhere between slowing down and collapsing, depends on what day you get up. I think it's collapse on a Wednesday, slowing down on a Monday, Thursday, we all get a break and get to go for a drink after work, and then on Friday, we're back to collapse again. So it depends what day you get up, but something bad is happening in China, no matter what day of the week that you get up. Um, this has been getting increasingly silly. The The fact of the matter is that Ch- the Chinese economy uh, hit its growth target last year, despite every financial outlet uh, in the English-speaking world, telling you it wasn't going to happen. And then when they hit their road target, the, every financial uh, publication in the English-speaking world tells you the numbers were fake. Well, why didn't you tell us that to begin with? Why were we even watching the growth targets? Uh, 
So this has become, this has been getting increasingly weird. It's now get, getting to the point where I think newspapers are very close to just telling their readers untruths, or as the uh, as the liberals like to say, fake news. Um, the Financial Times had a had a um, headline this week uh, that said uh, China's consumers tighten belts even as prices fall. The only problem is Chinese consumers are not tightening their belts even as prices fall. The latest figures show that in 2023, retail sales growth was up 7.2 percent, and in December it was up 7.4 percent. These are actually very high growth numbers, over 7%. They're also higher than the GDP growth, the, the, the GDP growth that hit its target of 5%, which indicates that the economy, at least by this metric, is becoming more consumer-oriented, which means that it's, it's somewhat rebalancing in the way that the Chinese wanted to do. But the fact of the matter is, consumer retail growth of 7.2% will be considered runaway in any other country. It, it, the, the headline on 7.2% growth should be stunning retail growth in 2023. But it's not. Instead, we're told that it didn't happen. We're told that the Chinese consumers, quote unquote, tightened their belt. And I read this article quite closely, and I realized two things. First of all, in one of the paragraphs, they actually they actually mention the seven two uh, seven point two percent growth, which is bizarre. It means that the authors knew that retail sales were up seven point two percent, and then what they do is they point to the deflation numbers, def deflation numbers in various goods, and they say, well, this shows a lack of demand. This shows consumers being uh, uh, pulling their pulling their money back. Well, no, it doesn't. It, it can either it can either sh it can show many things, but the, mo the two most obvious will be an increase in supply or a fall in demand. And since the retail sales are up by 7.2%, it's probably not demand because demand is growing. So it must be supply. Now, it could be a few other things. It could be lower energy costs. It could be this, it could be that, but just on a pure kind of basic macro take. So why wouldn't they say it's, um, why wouldn't they say it's increased demand? And then they show this chart um, of uh, Chinese car prices. And the chart uh, says Ch car prices in China are falling at a faster rate than in 2002. Not sure what happened in 2002. It wasn't the big recession or anything. And then they show the chart and it shows that apart from a very brief period in 2021, 2022, presumably when lockdown impacts uh, uh, went through, Chinese car prices have always been falling every single year. Chinese car prices are falling. And why is this? It's because if you look at any consumer price index, any CPI, and you break it down, you'll find that any good in the CPI basket, not any, but the vast majority of goods in the CPI uh, basket that are generally mass manufactured, and especially if they have technology in them, they're always falling in price. And this should be intuitively obvious to people. Cars get cheaper. You get better quality cars cheaper. You get better quality laptops cheaper year after year. And remember, CPI rates are quality adjusted. That's how they work. When you do the CPI index, you have to quality adjust them. And when you quality adjust them, you find that, lo and behold, technology gets cheaper every year. And everybody knows this because the phone that you have in your pocket today may cost the same as the phone you had in your pocket 10 or 15 years ago, but it's substantially better. This is a universal phenomenon. So this goes, but this goes beyond simple incompetence. There's now, there's now a hysteria. It's almost like a bubble. This reminds me of a financial bubble, like dot com or something, where everyone's whipped themselves into a frenzy about the looming disaster in China. And it's now gotten to the point, which is a real moment in any normal financial bubble, where you're just getting manifestly wrong headlines, misleading headlines that don't have data to back them up, published in what used to be high quality financial outlets. Yeah, specifically on the car price chart that the Financial Times showed, um, the uh, journalist and financial analyst, um, David Goodman, uh, Goldman, uh, wrote, uh, made the fascinating point that in uh, 1908, uh, Ford sold the Model T for $850. Uh, by 1925, which was the peak of the 1920s economic boom in America, it was selling the Model T Ford for only 
uh, two hundred and sixty dollars. So like a, you know a third of the price, even less. Uh, the price of cars goes down, and uh, you know as we all know, one of the big kind of secular. Uh, macroeconomic stories of the last kind of year 18 months has been the surge in Chinese car manufacturing uh, I believe I'm right in saying that they're now the biggest exporter of cars in the world so one would imagine that the Financial Times understands that there's been a huge surge in domestically produced uh, cars in China over the last couple of years right that's just commonplace knowledge is it not so why on earth wouldn't you think that prices would go down in such a scenario? That sounds like really strange, you know, especially as car prices, have been, as you say, have been going down constantly per that chart. It seems very strange. I mean, the last time we spoke about this issue, one of the points that I made, Philip, is that despite all of the doom mongering about the Chinese economy, I actually got, saw very little evidence of that. Like, you know, it's like people are saying this but providing very little new, fresh evidence of anything that's particularly gone wrong or any kind of credible macroeconomic evidence that the whole thing is collapsing. You know, you have folks like Michael Pettis, who for a long time has said that the Chinese economy is kind of grotesquely distorted and it's kind of cruising for a, a, a Japanese 19, late 80s, early 90s style collapse which is fine, but he's been saying that for a long time. Like, what's changed now for everybody else to be talking about this? Like, you know, they've gone from China's economic miracle to China is collapsing in the blink of an eye and seemingly based on no new data or evidence or logic or arguments. You know, it's a bit like watching sheep change direction. You know, like a, when you see a flock of sheep suddenly move in one direction all at the same time for some unfathomable reason. You know, you look around and there's no birds or there's nothing to scare them. It's just they've done it and they've all charged off across the field in the other direction. I get the impression that that's happening with financial journalists at the moment and it's bleeding into the mainstream media. I mean, one of the things, for example, they're saying is that foreign direct investment into China is collapsing. But foreign direct investment, first of all, is... I think you mentioned it to us on a, to me on a private chat the other day, Philip. Tell me if I'm wrong. But foreign direct investment is worth 1% of China's GDP. So, you know, even a big decline in foreign direct investment um, <laughs> it shouldn't really matter too much to the Chinese economy. Like, that's not evidence of some impending Chinese 1929-style collapse leading to a 1930-style Great Depression, which is the kind of narrative that we're seeing increasingly in places like the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, and even places like the Times in London and the New York Times. Um, I noticed, though, I noticed, though, Philip, that, and, and, and maybe you'll be able to help me on this because you're the kind of finance and macroeconomics guy. I am not. But I noticed that a lot of the language that they use, it, you know, it almost feels like they're projecting the language that they use with regard to our economies, even though our economies are very different to the Chinese economy. They're at very different stages of development and they're run on very different models. So, for instance, the, the headline that you mentioned, China, Ch Chinese consumers tighten their belts. That's very much a kind of like a post-global financial crisis, austerity measures, British headline. It's very much an American headline because, you know, the American economy is very much based on the consumer. You know, consumers tighten their belts. That's like a big news article in the United States where the economy is based on the strength of the consumer. George W. Bush famously said after 9-11 when asked what Americans could do. And he said, spend money in the shops. The consumer is important, so tightening belts would be important. The same with foreign direct investment. The United Kingdom uh, of Great Britain and Northern Ireland runs a big uh, current account deficit, a big trade deficit. And that means it is reliant on, 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 direct, on, on investment from abroad, putting money into the British economy to prop up the value of its currency, to stop the currency from declining like significantly. So FDI figures in Britain are always spoken about in even the mainstream press. Foreign direct investment, those statistics always get a mention in the mainstream press because it's a current account deficit country. China, on the other hand, has a massive current account surplus and FDI is like a tiny percentage of the economy. Okay, And I almost feel like we're kind of projecting our own malaise onto China to fit in with a narrative 
that has come from I don't know where. But it's very strange. It's a very bizarre thing because China, the Chinese economy does have problems. It, it, you know, it clearly needs to rebalance away from investment in industrial capacity, away from exports, and towards kind of, you know, internal demand. It, you know, the, that current account surplus that it runs is not a sign of, of kind of rude health. But at the same time, this has been an issue for, you know, 20 years now, and it's been rolling along quite happily. And, you know, I think really you need to have something that changes to justify such a a kind of like you know the that flock of sheep charging across a, a kind of right angles to the previous direction across the other end of the field it's very strange to me well you say that i'm kind of the economics guy but as you say i mean if it's a case of projection which i think it is we really need kind of a psychoanalyst here to talk about it not not an economist i think you're actually absolutely right this is this is clearly projection it's projection coming out of two places first of all all the stuff that they say about the Chinese economy is true of the Western economies right now. They're all stagnant at best. Okay, the US is growing a little bit, but it's running on the fumes of the Inflation Reduction Act fiscal expenditure. And every non-GDP poll or uh, proxy metric for the economy is awful, like manufacturing PMIs in decline, everything. I think things are ticking up a little bit now, but uh, all the metrics seem to be lighting up green in an election year, which has a lot of people questioning the metrics, frankly. And for the sentiment-based ones, I think those questions are actually quite valid. Um, so yeah, it seems like we're projecting. So so we're projecting the economic problems that we're experiencing in Britain, where the Financial Times is, is published, and in Europe, and we're projecting them onto China. Um I mean, that's kind of scary because, again, it kind of speaks to something that we alluded to in the last um, segment. It feels to me like people are beginning to wake up and realize that there's no plan. I think that the splash of water in the face here is the fact that the Ukraine war is going to clearly be lost. Now, of course, there's no inherent relationship between the economic decline of Europe and eventually it will hit America too pretty soon. Um, the economic decline of the West, actually. Um, there's no inherent link between that and the binary Ukraine war won, Ukraine war lost. Even if the Ukraine war was won and Russia were beaten back uh, into the territory of uh, the previous territory of Russia pre-2022, February 2022, whatever, it wouldn't make any difference to the actual overall economic situation, which is determined by the sanctions, by various other things. Um, so that wouldn't actually make any difference. I suppose you couldn't in conceivably say, oh, well, if if they were beaten right back to Moscow and there was regime change, then the gas would flow. And maybe this is what people believed. I don't know. I, I'm I'm checked out on trying to figure out what, what our elite think and the fantasies that they indulge in. But um but really, the, the, for whatever reason, the, the looming probable loss of the war in Ukraine, I think, is making people wake up and say, wow, there is no strategy. There's literally no strategy here. And what they're retreating into is, um, is pointing at, at, the, at, the, at the opponent and saying, uh, oh, no, we must find weakness. We must find weakness. That's a very bad place to be in, isn't it? I mean, that you can't, for example, the Financial Times has declined in quality a lot in the past few years. There's absolutely no doubt about that. That's this isn't just due to the um to the current situation. I don't think the Financial Times could be publishing headlines like that if it hadn't deteriorated in quality in the past ten years. But, you know, the Financial Times is still kind of the boardroom reading in Europe at least. Wall Street Journals in America. Here in Europe, the Financial Times is, and it's mainly read by kind of, you know, uh, people involved in diplomacy and high levels of politics economists, think tanks, these all read the Financial Times. And they're not getting a steady diet of here's the reality and having discussions in the editorial page about how the Western economies move forward as, you know, a progressive forward-looking country or region would. They're just getting propaganda. Most of it, which are lies, actually. I mean, it's not even good propaganda. It's just made up nonsense at this point. And they're being fed a steady diet of this. And, you know, outside the window, everything's on fire. And, you know, it's like that dog meme where he's drinking his coffee and the room's on fire and he's reading his newspaper. It's the Financial Times in this instance. And he's going, this is fine. Well, it's not fine. And continuing to focus on, on statistics that don't exist on China and publishing fake news about the country, it's not going to get your country anywhere. 
And it's not gonna it's not gonna put this elite in a stable position uh, to govern. It all feels very very fabrile at the moment. Warlike and Egyptian. Every week we try to provide our listeners with an update on what's going on in uh, the Middle East, uh, specifically regarding the uh, Israel-Gaza conflict. Um, Not so much in terms of a blow-by-blow account of what's happening there, which you can get from any news media outlet, but trying to look a little bit more deeply into the geostrategic and economic uh consequences of some of the events there now there's a big one this week um last week as israel moves farther into gaza into the south of gaza um they threatened to or or they announced that they planned uh to begin a land operation in rafa rafa is a part of the gaza strip a kind of a city in the gaza strip pressed right against the border of um, Sinai, Egypt, essentially. And the Egyptians had always warned Israel that that was a red line for them because a lot of the refugees from the north of Gaza, where the majority of the population live, had filtered south toward Rafa. And the Egyptians have always been concerned about, uh, for various reasons that we've discussed in previous podcasts. So if you want to know, go back and listen to some previous podcasts, but the Egyptians have always been concerned about the prospect of, you know, a million or two million refugees from Gaza flooding into Egypt. And they viewed any ground operation that might precipitate that as a red line. Over the weekend, uh, I think over the weekend, it emerged that the Egyptians were threatening in the event of any Israeli ground attack to annul basically a unilaterally withdraw from the Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty that is some four decades old if the Israelis did this. And, and, and this really caused alarm bells. Now, in the last hour, as of recording, we're recording this on a Monday evening, um, and the Egyptian foreign minister has said that Cairo has no intention of severing this peace deal. However, if... Benjamin Netanyahu goes ahead and orders such a ground attack against the um, against the desires of Egypt and uh, and certainly against the increasingly desperate calls for restraint from the United States State Department and White House. Then I would imagine that the peace deal might well be on the table. Now, I know, given certain interviews over the last week. It's not particularly fashionable to go into a whole bunch of history, but let's just try and cover four decades rather than, you know, a millennia or four centuries in this little history lecture. Um, After the uh, Yom Kippur War, um, Egypt um, sought to slowly make peace with, um, make its peace with Israel. Uh, This was really started with, uh, by Henry Kissinger, who moved between uh, all of the Arab nations, including in e- Egypt and Israel, in what became known as shuttle diplomacy, and they kind of invented that phrase, shuttle diplomacy. And Kissinger played a very subtle game in which he was trying to peel off Egypt from the other Arab nations for the benefit of Israel, but also to peel Egypt off from the influence of the Soviet Union as well. And he was attempting to separate the Arab countries from each other and he succeeded and this ultimately culminated in the Camp David Accords mediated by then President Jimmy Carter and the final recognition of Israel as a state and and the and Egypt becoming the first of the Arab countries to um, you know normalize relations with Israel whereby they had um, whereby they had ambassadors in each other's country, etc., etc. And this did indeed peel Egypt off from the United Arab Front, and it infuriated the other Arab nations, especially um, especially Assad, uh, Bashar al-Assad's father, Hafiz Assad, who had wanted a United Arab Front. He, you know, he'd wanted something of a federation, um, which would give it more power, Uh, in the world, and especially with regards to the Israel-Palestine question. This 
meant that Egypt got, a, a, you know, quite a lot of uh, American aid over the years. And, you know, America's been sending about a billion dollars worth of economic aid and, crucially, a billion dollars worth of military aid since the early 1980s. So is, Egypt has become, I believe I'm right in saying, um, the third or fourth largest recipient of U.S. military aid um, after Israel and Pakistan, um, you know, in the last 20 or 30 years. So, you know, this has really been a big deal. And what it's allowed the U.S. to do, it's first of all allowed them to split the Arab nations on the Israel question. It, it, it's meant that there hasn't been a united front. Egypt has always been since the war the most powerful of the Arab nations. You know, people assume that it's maybe Saudi Arabia for its oil, or maybe not an Arab nation, but Iran because of its, you know, its more recent power. It's, it's not Arab, it's Persian, but still in the region. But actually, the real Arab power has always been Egypt, and it, and it put Egypt more in the American camp. For instance, recently, despite the fact that Russia had sent Arab, uh, Egypt grain to help feed its population, despite the fact that uh, Russia had help, was, you know, work helping Egypt work on a nuclear program. Egypt refused to provide Russia with uh, missiles, for example, and and instead gave them to uh, the United States. So it, it gave the U.S. a lot of influence there. It also gave Israel a quiescent southern border, so it could concentrate on, you know, uh, internal issues in places like the West Bank, but also in defending places like the Golan Heights. Okay, so this is really good for Israel. It was really good for the U.S. And now what's happening? Now Israel and the U.S.'s inability to rein Israel in might just blow all of that out of the water. So not only might you draw the most powerful Arab nation into the conflict directly, but even if they're not pulled in directly, even if they just withdraw from this treaty, you could now have a militarized Sinai Peninsula again. You could have a very dangerous southern border which israel would have to defend against egypt and the arab nations would move closer together which would prevent the americans with their divide and conquer uh strategy it you know it would just undo all of this work which had left israel and the u.s in a very nice position and now we're talking about undoing it so this is really potentially big news and it, it it's just not being reported as usual as that it's you know oh they might withdraw from a peace agreement yeah but this this has really serious ramifications and people should be aware of it yeah i mean as you say um you know we've been walked back from the brink now it looked a little scary there but clearly the egyptians are trying to send a message to the israelis here um and it's a pretty strong message um how serious is it well i'll talk about that in a minute i think it's more serious than people let on if this were to occur, if this peace uh, 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 treaty were to break down, it could be it could be pretty chaotic. I mean, I know it may sound hyperbolic, and I'll get into my reasoning for it in a moment. But if a conflict uh, broke out between Egypt and Israel, Israel will be in 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 major trouble. Um, it will be, it's hard to overstate how much trouble uh, Israel will be in. Just to give some sense. Um, in terms of active personnel, the Egyptian army has about 440,000 troops. The Israeli Defense Forces only have about 170,000 troops. They have similar reserves, both around 460, 470,000. But immediately you look at the raw numbers and you realize Egypt is not just a much larger country than Israel, but it's got a much larger military. And that's because Egypt has a really, really serious military. Um, it's also very, very well equipped. Um, so just to give some sense, according to the Wikipedia page, um, Egypt has 32 Patriot missile systems. 32. Uh, how many did they give Ukraine? I mean, it couldn't have been more than that. In addition to that, they've got four S-300 systems that they've bought from Russia, and they've got seven of the Iris T German systems, which uh, are are medium range ones, but they're I assume similar technology. And then they've got a bunch of you know shorter range stuff. Uh, you look at the Israeli um, uh, air defense; it is nowhere near that. I mean, they have some Patriots, but they don't have thirty two. Um, they have the they have Iron Dome, but it's it's that's that's been a bit over exaggerated, really. That's for for those very small Hamas missiles. What you immediately come away with just from that 
is that um, Egypt could probably clo- close the Israeli skies pretty easily. It's a small country. Um, they'd probably close the, the Israeli skies immediately, and Israel almost completely rely on their air force for their strength. Just really quickly, in terms of other um, uh, military strength here, just to get some sense, um, Israel have a roundabout uh, active, now this is probably prior to some of them being destroyed in Gaza, um, they, they had about 500 tanks ready to go. They had another kind of 900 stored. Um, Egypt looked like they have about 4,000 ready to go. So, um, <laughs> a lot more in storage. So Egypt's army is just orders of magnitude bigger and better equipped than Israel's army, and it's a much bigger country. Okay, but, you know, listeners will say, but come on, Egypt and Israel will never, never go to war. The current Egyptian government would not go to war with Israel likely, and there's a very good chance that they would never go to war with Israel um, because they're relatively uh, uh, palsy with the, with the Americans. But they have been condemning the action in Gaza quite strenuously, and they have to. And they also kind of have to make noises like this about tearing up the peace treaty because they're speaking to their domestic audience. And the domestic audience are uh, not going to tolerate it, the, the Egyptian government taking too soft a line here. Now, at the extreme, Israel's not a very stable place. We had the uh, overthrow of, I think, two governments in quick succession in the Arab Spring. That's where the current government comes from. The government could be overthrown in Egypt. Um, if something, if a really bad crisis happened, like a refugee crisis from Gaza and a bunch of really nasty uh, photos and videos of, of dead Palestinians coming out, being crushed across the border, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that could trigger a rebellion in Egypt. If that happened during the Arab Spring, the Muslim Brotherhood came to power in Egypt for a brief period. If that happened again, a government like that could conceivably go to war with Israel. So we're playing a very, da- well, we're not. The Israelis are playing a very, very dangerous game here. I think the Americans are aware of how dangerous it is. Um, I think the Israelis still haven't really grasped how dangerous it is. But definitely w- worth watching. Listeners of the show should watch the Rafa border, see what's going to happen there. And if you see some really brutal scenes there or a stampede of refugees or spilling out of refugees into Egypt, pay close attention because very crazy things could happen next. Next. 